profit later. Yep, I'm gonna do this. So we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And restarts each time. Recording continued.
Hello. 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 You're in. You're automatically a host. It's magic. It's working. Oh, cool. Um, could I join? Um, so this is my mobile phone. Um, uh, could I also join without like camera on my laptop? Let's find out if a multiple logins are. I don't know. Let's try it. So I do know that I think their phone like support is is pretty limited like i don't think you can do screen sharing and things like that but you know this oh. seems to work so well so far yeah i see a screen sharing button too my the camera on my laptop's broken and i been broken for a while but i guess it didn't matter before covid but i guess i agree exactly <laughs> now everyone just wants to see your lovely face every moment <laughs> yeah i've just using been using my mobile though it's been okay for most things I bet it's got a better camera than you've got on most laptops, so you're ahead of the game. It's true. Let's see. I know. Look at you, cursed with too much beautiful natural light. So you got to like cover it all up. Uh, microphone don't allow. Um. 
All right, I'm here. Sweet. And I have actually something happened. I may have taken over actually. Um, seems like your new version disappeared. And gone. You are back. So maybe it did freak out after all. Uh, it did. Um, you can't be on two places at once. But right. actually, uh, you can chat on here. Boom. Good. So you're just going to be oh, like a power pretty... thumb ty typer. <laughs> we'll see. This is actually pretty good. It's like almost as good as Zoom or whatever. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, yeah, it's like they must have white labeled something. And then because... Yeah, you yeah, know, like, this is a side it's... thing. You know, this is not where they're going to put all their effort. Yeah, no, it's great. So uh, I'm going to do so. I'm going to try out a screen share. And do you want to go by Daniel, Dan? How do you prefer? Yeah, um, uh, I think most people call me Danny. Co host Danny. Okay, got it. But, CTA, yeah. your own sessions. Okay. Got it. Cool. So let me try the screen share and see if that works. I'm going to try to do the full on share. And if I pop over here. Yeah. Magic. All right. Good. That sounds really, that sounds good. So here's, here's what I'm planning on doing. Basically just say like, we'll talk about some of the ways you can visualize communities um, and then we'll do an engagement pyramid um, and maybe a persona depending on the time we'll do a quick icebreaker about basically what's a memorable customer or membership experience and that'll be our go around then we'll talk about triangles we'll talk about sales funnels uh, we'll talk about so there's some best practice around the engagement pyramid. And then I'll say like, here's some examples of what that could look like. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna break up and actually build a pyramid together. Um, and uh, and so ideally, it would be lovely if someone, you know, someone suggests an example, but if that does not happen, I'm wondering if you have something maybe in your back pocket that could be used as just like, something we could drop into the engagement pyramid. Do you have like any work or projects you've done where you think you could just sort of map out like how the members fit into these rough categories? Leaders, contributors, endorsers, followers, observers. Yeah, and as an example of that here, I'll show you sort of the other example I had. Um, ba, 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 ba. So for me, you'll see it's like, yeah, my low level people are like my social followers. Then I have my event attendees. Then I've got people who've sort of filled out like a referral form. Um, and then I've got people like, oh, they started a group. They're amazing. Or they became an assistant organizer. 
or they're a lead organizer. So that's sort of for me with my meetups, how I sort of divide out the different levels of engagement mm. by my community. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I like the idea. I'd probably have to think about it a bit more. But uh, Well, you've I, got three minutes until we start. So you're. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, yeah, I guess every community has a layer of that. I guess I just have to distinguish my layers. Yeah. And I think we can do this roughly, or you could sort of describe things and say, like, they do this. And people were like, I think that fits in the contributor level. Um, yeah, sure. You mean, yeah, because I, I, I could fake this, well, but I'd love to have you team. basically maybe do the, the sort of the example if no one else steps up with an example. For sure. Cool. I, actually, I think I think uh, I know I think I know how to fill out that. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, cool. And yeah, and we'll do it sort of together as a group. Yeah. So we'll build that pyramid. Fun. Um, then we'll talk a little bit like, you know, like thinking about what are the benefits of participation? Like, why are people actually going through this journey with you? And then how do you build that architecture of participation to sort of that user experience side of things? Uh, and then we'll probably, depending on the time, do a persona and we'll sort of, again, pop into here and in real time, fill one out. Um, let's like go deep into this Pikachu um, and figure out like what drives a Pikachu? Sorry. So I think then we'll do a persona as the last piece of the uh, of the presentation um, as our next group exercise. And I imagine by that point, time will have moved quickly and we'll be all done. <laughs> uh you're cutting out a bit, but I feel like I heard most of what you were saying. All right. Well, hopefully uh, it is mostly coming through. I will kill all the other apps I've got in the background and try and give yeah, myself. Yeah, it's just lagging slightly. It's like breaking. Right. Not so lagging. I'm going to try an experiment, which is to say if I don't do a share everything, but rather a share something. So what if I go share screen instead of all things, I say a specific application. So we say we like, we're going to do I, it's still breaking a bit right now, but it's a lot better when I don't do the screen share cat. Yeah. It, it is, is my voice breaking a bit? No, you sound great. So, so it's clearly all my fault. My upload speeds are grumpy about that. Oh, well, maybe or it could. Yeah. I mean, it could also be me. Well, sure, I know. We could all take on blame, but uh <laughs> <laughs> I mean I I think it's the funny thing with this, no one knows. Like uh could be Exactly. I paid for as much internet as I can get, but you know, I can't get fiber into my building since I, I've got a grumpy strata who doesn't believe in newfangled things. So uh here we go. And how was uh, the, the login process? Were you able to navigate that? I think we've got a third person uh, here now. Yeah, I mean, I think I was a bit unique because I logged in on my computer and then had to log in on my um, on my mobile. But it was, it's fine. It just required me to figure out what my password was. Cool. Well, hi there, Deb. Welcome. Um, we'll probably be starting up, you know, about five, six minutes after the hour. You'll come in by uh, with your camera and mic turned off by default, but you're welcome to turn them both on. I've got a new person. Hi there, Ali. Welcome. As you come in, you'll see that your mic and camera are turned off, but uh, try and turn those back on. We'd love to see and hear you. Is everyone from Vancouver here? I don't think so. I think people from a number of different places, but I think that's a, a key question. Okay, they're not seeing the settings. Well, then I'm going to see what else we can learn here. I'm just going to go through and start 
Ah, here we go. All attendees. Audio on. Boom. Does that work? Or not? Let me find out. One moment. It's going to refresh my browser. Hello. Hey there, friends. I've changed this. Aha, success. Looks like people are able to start wandering in. Perfect. Let's see some people show up. Up. Oh, magic. Deb, we almost have you. I still got you on mute, but otherwise, you are mostly there. Um, Eli, you're kind of bringing up on my side, but I don't know if it's me. He sounds fine to me. Hey, Deb. Windows oh, boxes, me. close the boxes. The number one thing with all these calls. I haven't used this platform, so I don't, I'm not familiar. But, but yes, I suspect you're totally correct. Like, it's my phone. The secrets everywhere should work. Hi, friends. As you've come in, I've tried to put you into something called presenter mode, which means you should be able to come in and turn off, turn on your mic, make all that stuff happen. Yay, we've got Sophie. Hey, everyone. Fun, excellent. Sophie is the person who put this whole group together. You know, <laughs> so I'm just here, you know, like trudging around on in her footsteps. And, Trying to, you know, not shame her too much. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. What what are we going to do about this? You're just putting a lot of pressure on yourself that doesn't need to be there. <laughs> Sometimes I just like to talk big, you know, a little bit of hyperbole, just to get things <laughs> going. Excellent. So we're going to be starting up. I'd say let's do two more minutes from now. Just let people come in. Um, Sophie and Danny, um, as new people come in, um, since you're host, you can actually see from the attendee tab that you're able to go in and you'll see there's like a little drop down by each person. And as they come in, you just want to make sure that they have presenter powers. Um, Okay. And that will then allow them to do mics um, and audio and all that good stuff. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. And I think I've got most people in on that right now. As you can see, like they've got the icons available in that little attendee view, but just oh, in I case. Christine, I apologize. You were my guinea pig. I un unpresented you. I just represented you. And it's a good reminder to people that if you ever drop in or drop out, you only just need to restart your audio and uh, camera from the little button at the bottom. Hmm. 
So, in our final little minute, like, who do we have here and what glamorous places are you from? So, I'm Eli. I'm in glamorous Vancouver where we only have just a teeny bit of forest fire smoke. Same here. Well, I guess New Westminster where we have equal amounts of smoke. I'm also from Vancouver. Who was that? Natalie. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it's Danny here. I'm, I'm also from Vancouver. All right, it's feeling really West Coast so far. Rashmi said she's from India in the chat. Okay, oh, excellent, thank you. And I appreciate that. Yeah, I won't be able to follow the chat through. So uh, we'll have Danny working on the chat line today, which means if you're both, if you don't want to turn on your mic or you're feeling a little shy, you can drop any kind of question or comment into the chat through there and Danny can be your voice. So, and he'll basically uh, just interrupt me and make sure it, it comes forward so we can all hear um, and see if I can answer your question or turn to the other smart people in the room. We got two people in the house from uh, East Coast. Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. I live in the capital city of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Christine yeah. just posted that she's from New Jersey in the chat. So two oh. East Coast represent. Nice. I was out in California actually two weeks ago, though, and I drove right past the fires, and now I, I understand they're much worse. So I was glad I got out there when I did to do two-week road trip. Photos make, uh, make me nervous, all those photos. I was in Harrisburg a long, long time ago. I spent some time in the Shenandoah Valley. Oh, one beautiful. Christmas. Yeah. Had to go to Pennsylvania and learn how to ski. Yeah, I hope we don't have snow this year. I'm not looking forward to that. I'm trying to move west next year, but <laughs> but yeah, snow is nice when we don't have too much of it. <laughs> no, that is the Lord's truth. You know, just a little bit, and it's just peachy kino. So why don't we start in? I've turned on the screen sharing, and uh, basically, <clears throat> I'll start and say like, "Hi there, I'm Eli. I'll be your host for today's session." Um, warning: We're going to put you to work. There's at least two exercises where we're going to like fill things out together. So uh, limber up your fingers, get your brains going. That's the work we're going to do. Um, as I mentioned today, my co-host is Danny, who will be running the chat and will probably be like convinced to lead one of our upcoming events this fall. And speaking of which, I have a call to action, which is to say, look, I don't want to have to fake in a topic every couple months. I would love to have you know other people in the group come forward as event producers. And that doesn't mean you have to present. It means instead you could maybe put together a panel discussion, or maybe you interview someone within this group. So anything that you're excited or curious about in the community space, like throw an idea at me, and I'd love to work with you to put an event together. So you're saying, what are we doing here today? Um, and I think we're going to do two things. One, we're going to review just a few of the ways that you can visualize your community. There's lots more. Um, and then two, the part where you actually have to do work, we're going to complete an engagement pyramid um, and probably a persona too, depending on how the time looks. So icebreakers, here we go. Um, I'd love to know, like, what was a memorable customer or membership experience you've had, and why? Like, like, what was what was really special about that? Because I'm not cruel, I'll start off with an example, and then I'll pass it around to you. So, uh, I was a volunteer for many years with a folk music festival, um, and I don't really like folk music. Um, but I kept around with this group of volunteers for years and years because what I most loved is wandering across that site that we had built together with a super sense of ownership. We could like walk behind any stage, cut any line. Like we were basically, you know, the bosses of this event. And, and that deep sense of ownership because we built it and then we ran it and therefore no doors controlled us was super addictive. And so that's what kept me around in that community. Anyone else have something? Go for it. Um, 
the first thing that came to mind was uh, volunteering at the TED conference here in Vancouver, TEDx, sorry, not TED. I know we have both now. Um, they had an extreme, um, they had a lot of gratitude for their volunteers. And um, during the entire event, the number of times that one of their full-time staff came over and asked volunteers if they needed a break, if they had time to eat food, if they had time to like go outside and relax for a minute was probably the best experience I've had as a volunteer. Like I usually you volunteer for events and no one really cares if you've had lunch. <laughs> um, so it was really great to be recognized in that way. And at the end of the day, they actually took some time to have the whole team come out and thank the entire volunteer base, which I thought was excellent and, and definitely um, kept a lot of us coming back for the following years. Nice. Anyone? In person events or uh, it, virtual events? It doesn't events specifically have to be an event. It can really just be like even a customer experience. So as an example, the fact that the Amazon delivery people, as much as I think they are probably not well treated overall, the fact that they will like text me and say like, hey, can I deliver right now? As opposed to just like randomly coming to my door is such a pleasurable experience. I'm just like, oh, right. I know what's happening. I know where they are. I can communicate with them and say, like, give me another 10 minutes. Like, I just think that kind of deep communication and back and forth opportunity is another experience I really value. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I mean, I can share an experience pretty recently. I am a host in the Mighty Networks. I don't know if you're familiar with Mighty Networks. Uh, Gina and Jessica, the two people that run the community design course for Mighty Network hosts, are very responsive. And really, they hundreds of people come through those courses and they try and respond. Uh, Jessica does like one person basically is like managing lots of things all at one time and doing a really great job of getting quick responses to people. So I feel like, um, you know, they prioritize that above a lot of other things because they want their hosts to be successful. And, um, you know, they can't always answer questions, but they always help you get the resources and try to answer as best they can. They offer lots of office hours for hosts to join um, during the week so that if you're taking the class and then have questions during the week about the course, then you can jump on the office hours and raise your hand and ask questions. So I think that um, platform is really successful in a lot of ways because of not just what they offer on their platform, but the customer service that they provide to their hosts. Nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this may be a bit, I don't know if it's obvious is the right word, but uh, like I've been enjoying the YouTube comments lately. So like I have uh, I follow this really positive uh, slash kind YouTube blogger slash food traveler called Mark Wines on YouTube. And he gets a lot of views, but his YouTube channel, it feels like a community and the people that comment are like always say such kind things and they talk about the culture that he visits in the video that it's <laughs> kind. Yeah, that it like it's a, I feel like YouTube's had such negative connotation with comments that I don't know, I feel like it depends what kind of videos you're watching that some videos and some YouTube personalities have a positive community that they build up through their comments. Interesting. Yeah, it, totally surprising to me, but I guess that is the power of like a good, like, you know, convener, someone who's created a really good space. Lovely. Anyone want to be the last person to come off mic or on mic? Well, then let's dive into this. Um, and remember, you can always uh, put yourself back, you know, it put something into the chat window and uh, you can come back to that later. So ice has been broken, kapow. So what I'd like to do today is get all math nerdy with you, um, geometry specifically. So we're gonna talk about sort of the geometry of community. Um, because it all comes down to the triangle in my perspective. Let us all hail the twirly, twirly triangle. 
you know, as you always say, the triangle is like, you know, the strongest of all the shapes, um, you know, um, and you can <laughs> see it showing up all over the place in this world. So many of you are familiar with a sales funnel, which is basically the way you can sort of model out how people enter a relationship and move to like deeper levels of engagement. Um, you know, and this is an example of, you know, me just doing a quarterly snapshot of some of the volunteer management I've been doing as I onboard people into meetups in my own community. And you can see, I start with a ridiculous number of applications, but I only have a 25% conversion. Um, and so this kind of model is really helpful because it starts you to start thinking about like, well, like at what stage am I losing people? And, and how am I losing people? And therefore, how can I tweak my process and, and can I get more efficient? Or in my case, how do I create a higher barrier for my application? Because as I can see, most of them aren't that good. So let's let's actually increase the barriers to entry. I mean, when I started running these this funnel and put all my volunteers into a CRM and then took this funnel methodology, I actually you know, had this huge spike in the number of new groups created per year because suddenly it went from me trying to like say like, oh yeah, I think that person emailed a month ago. I should totally follow up to now I had scheduled rigorous reminders saying like, this is what, you know, time to follow up with this person. This person's stuck in this phase for three weeks. Um, and so just putting that rigor there, you know, really helped me increase my conversions um, because I'm starting to now model through the journey that I was taking people through as I was onboarding them into new meetup volunteers. So because I come from the nonprofit world, we like to turn things upside down. So most of the business world believes in the funnel. Nonprofits, because we're purposely different, like to play instead with the pyramid, which of course is the same damn thing turned upside down. And there's that pyramid is useful, and I think in two ways we'll talk about. So one of those is it's a really great reminder of you know the old 90, 10, even 1% rule, which is to say most people, lurkers. A small number actually want to do something, and then there's like this very small golden group who are like out there making things actually happen. And, uh, and you know, it makes me weep sometimes, but that's the reality. So therefore work within that. And I think that kind of model of knowing that people are not all different or all the same is actually really helpful because when you start modeling people out into these kinds of pyramids, it helps you just think through the fact that not everyone wants to contribute in the same way. Um, and therefore you shouldn't be putting the exact same amount of investment into every single one of your community members. Um, some people, the investment's totally worth it. Others need to get like the lightest kind of support because any extra effort you put into them is honestly wasted effort. Um, and what you want to start doing is figuring out who are the people who are worth that extra effort. And so the community engagement pyramid was created by a group called Groundwire, you know, probably 20 years ago. Um, and all it did was say, like, let's put some names to these different levels of the engagement pyramid. And so that's everyone from the visitors who just showed up on your website to the people who maybe joined your email newsletter because they gave you a little bit more attention to the people who joined your forums and are like now actually maybe writing the occasional post. Or maybe you've got some super evangelists. People are out there who are recruiting for you, spreading the gospel. And because you can split these people into these different layers, now you start to think around, how do I engage people differently at each one of these layers? Like, what do they actually need? What do they want? And what can I offer them? And then how do we actually start moving some of those people who say are members to that contributor level, knowing that not all of them are going to, but you know, there's like this five, 10% in those groups who will be keen for more engagement. And so like, what are the indicators that gets them to that next level of engagement? And so now I'm gonna you know, create some terrible art. This is me drawing. As you can see, I'm not an artist. Um, 
you should take a look at the background of Sophie's Place. It's actually full of beautiful, amazing art. Um, but this is the art that I create. Um, and so <laughs> what you can see here is I'm, again, trying to model out my same meetup community um, and start with social followers. I've got a lot of them. And then I've got event attendees, I've got slightly less. And then I've got people who actually said, like, I would love to start a group. Way, 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 way less. Um, and then of that, only maybe half of them actually get to even holding an interview with me. So you can see I'm winnowing it down. Um, and therefore, as I get closer to the top, these people get more and more of my effort and time. So what I'd love to do is build a pyramid with you, which means you have to actually do some work with me. I know it's horrific, but we're going to do it and it's going to be fun. Um, and you're going to watch me uh, tumble about in real time in lucid chart. So, uh, so I would love to have someone who can maybe like give us an example and we can actually like sort of map that community out into these different phases. Um, and so if you can come off mute, that would be great because uh, we can sort of do this together. So, so Danny, I think you had a couple, like an idea of a community that might fit within this model. Oh yeah, I was I was gonna bring up the community I work on, but I was thinking maybe because everyone knows maybe YouTube is an interesting community. Uh, if that's something people want to work on, uh, yeah. If people also want to, uh, yeah. So YouTube is a cool idea. So so tell me more about this YouTube community that you've been part of. Um, well, I. Uh, maybe YouTube's a weird one, but I feel like YouTube has sub communities. I think the creator of the channel sets a tone, hopefully at times, and then the the comments under it, uh, the, there's, anyone can watch it, but the people that add comments to the bottom and reply to the comments are, I would say, are part of the community. Right. So we've got a couple different things. So there are there's watchers. There is, there's definitely uh, people who are the commenters. Um, how else are people like the people who sort of click that that follow button within the system? How else? Yeah, maybe YouTube is a weird one because I feel like uh, there, like there's a maybe it's not a real community because you don't get it. It's more like a, as I'm saying it talking out loud i'm realizing it's not a community because it's really a one-way relationship uh and you don't really get to interact as much as maybe other platforms like reddit or other bigger communities i mean i mean certainly i think of some like you know which are also like a patreon tied into them where people do come in you know they're contributing money they're contributing ideas um for like future yeah. events so I, I think there's something there actually so, so let's try and figure that out. So I think YouTube is easy in that observers, who are those people? They're probably the people who watch videos. They just showed up on the page. Yeah. Showed up because of the algorithm. Or because of one of the endorsers or contributors. So they could have been recommended as well. So when we come to look at followers, like I think there's people like they're always saying like click and subscribe. Like you know there's there's this magic mantra word everyone gives. So I think there's definitely people the subscribers. So that's one way we can get down there. Um, but talk to me a little bit more about these people who are who are doing the recommend the recommending, like these endorsers, like people who are giving the reputation. Who are these kinds of people? Where do they fit within all this? Um, I have a comment. Yeah, I, the, the way I was thinking, uh, but feel free if anyone else has ideas to chime in. Um, I was thinking in two different ways for endorsers. I feel like one, because it's a technical product, uh, 
you can like upvote a video and that like helps uh, helps YouTube know for the algorithms that uh, it's better. But I think the thing that uh, the, the more important factor for me is if a friend told me or shared with me a link that they really cared about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so recommendations by friends. Yeah. I know certainly in YouTube, sometimes people have like even like video replies. They're like, I'm creating like my own content almost in, in like following up or in reply. Or maybe it's like a Patreon member. So someone who's actually putting money down. What are some other examples? Like, so what else, how else can people contribute into sort of being part of like a YouTube channel that they're super into? I think some people also moderate. I mean, they don't have maybe the moderation tools that something like Mighty Networks might have, but they do it in their own way by trying to police bad actors. Or, right. And, you know, sometimes moderate badly, but... Um, yeah. Right. But yeah, they're moderating the chat, setting the tone, like as you talked about, like, you know, it's not just one person who makes a, the, a YouTube chat turn into a healthy place, but it's all the participants in it. Where would you put people who are, I know on YouTube, you often have um, content creators that are like, they'll create something on their channel talking about yours or in response to what you've uh, posted and things like that. Yeah, so basically like other channels in conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely a contribution. I like that. And and like, what do you think is the, the top of the pyramid? What is the number one contribution involvement you can make if you're a super fan of a YouTube channel? I think you can do, oh, I know, I'm sorry. Another contribution is suggesting ideas, topics. Obviously, you know, I live with a fundraiser, so she's always gonna say like, money. Like, you know, did they put some, some cash down to make that happen? Wouldn't that be your patron members? Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. yeah. So they need to, need to move up. Yeah, I'll move those up. So I think that's one for sure. Um, you know, and I actually think maybe we're going to say like people who are doing like the actual like the video replies, the channels in conversation. I think that's actually another key piece to it, which is to say you know they're out there in the content production world. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a rough start for us here, um, just to you know, start off the conversation. And I think as we look at these, the next question I always say is like, well, how do we start getting people up that engagement ladder? You know, I say like, oh, like how do we start getting people from watching into subscribing? And I think obviously in YouTube, they're gonna say like and subscribe, you know, there's click the button over here, like they're they're not leaving it to chance. They're making it's very clear exactly what their desired call to action is. And I think, you know, when you talk about your subscribers, like, you know, how do you get them to I guess again, like, you know, retweet, share on social, tell a friend. Again, I think people are just saying, like, by the way, you should like tell a friend, you know like, subscribe, I'll send you stickers, like, you know, creating some incentives around that as well. And then I think obviously to get people into like these Patreon membership, I think often like when we talk about how do we get people there, I think what we often do is there's like exclusive content is a really key piece to that or early 
access or voting on topics. So, you know, getting either like inside access, early access, or some level of exclusivity where you get to contribute to the creation. So I think that's a couple ways where you can sort of look at us doing this. So let's jump back into the, uh, the deck again. Because uh, I think, you know, one of the questions I always say to myself is, what are the benefits of participation? Um, because, you know, what, if people have a lot of things to do with their time, so what actually is making them spend their time to engage with you? Um, and I think what I've learned over the years, um, doing a lot of volunteer management, is that it's not really about you or your cause or your company. Like people are just not ultimately that excited about you. Um, I know it hurts, makes us weep, but that's the sort of the reality I keep on seeing. Um, people tend to participate for a mix of both selfish and some really altruistic reasons. Um, you know, because when we actually look at volunteers, which essentially almost all community members are, they're, you know, they're contributing their time and we are typically not giving them any money for it. Um, they're doing it because they feel that it's going to improve their own well-being and make them happy, whether that's engaging with excited people on a YouTube comment, you know, sharing, you know, their own comments and feedback on a video, um, or whether they're like me going to a folk festival because I want to, you know, be, you know, the cock of the walk and uh, and feel like I'm in, I own this thing. Um, the other thing we know about volunteers is they do it because they want to meet new people, make new friends. Um, so it's really often this bit a social experience. Um, so it's a really strong reminder. And I think I heard some of that from Sophie as well around her experience with TEDx, which is it is about going out there and, you know, and being part of this community and, and having these, you know, these relationships with people who know they, they've got their back. Um, and the other reason I see people get involved with community is because they love to show off. And so as we build our communities, I think it's important for us to create opportunities where people get to show off their expertise, the skills they've got, because um, who isn't at their heart a show off? And so when you're building out these communities, I think it's often really helpful to say, as they move people through those stages of the engagement pyramid, what is my architecture of participation? Um, you know, and that's always just the like, how do we make it really easy for people to contribute, like to knock down unnecessary barriers? Um, what sense of ownership can you give? Because that is one of the best things we can give that doesn't cost money. Which is to say, someone comes in and says, like, this is not someone else's community I'm participating in, but rather this is my community. That, that I ultimately I own and and I'm a full participant in. Um, you know, the other thing you want to do is how do you encourage the activities you want, whether that's with a direct call to action or by creating, say, a healthy comment section where there are very clear rules for people who say, like, if you're being a jerk, this is not the place for you. And so you really create a space that encourages the activity you want and discourages the activities you don't. And then I think coming back to that thing I was talking about before, which is to say, how do we support the creation of relationships between people, whether that's in person, online, because that is the thing that's going to keep people in a community more than, than anything else. Um, to me, one of the best examples of this was uh, when I was in university, I had a friend who was super duper addicted to first... Um, what was it called? Diablo. Um, and then later on was super into Final Fantasy Online. No, Fantasy Star Online. Um, and I thought it was the most insane thing I could see because as far as I could tell, she never played the game. All she did was hang out in like the lobbies and basically use this complicated thing with this big graphic user, user interface as essentially a text chat tool um, and would spend hours there uh, you know, building and nurturing these relationships with other people. 
And so, well, technically she was in a game environment, that was the least important part of it as far as I could tell, because all the time was really spent in the relationship part. So that's me talking about that part. I would love to put you to work again. So here's my question. Who here knows our friend Pikachu? Am I the only one? <laughs> no, I've heard of him. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is another way to think about um, the people in our community is to do a persona. Um, and a persona is basically you saying, I'm going to think deeply about like a, a typical but very specific person in your community. So it's not like you're doing a demographic profile. So, you know, so you don't want to say like, I am writing like what is in typical women who are 30 to 45 interested in. Rather, you want to go and say, who is one specific person in my community who is representative, but also a specific human being and create a couple of these to start thinking about who are these core players in your community? Because what you want to do is really think deeply about what are the goals and their motivations. Um, so when I do this within my own community, I've got a couple key people I keep on turning to. I've got one volunteer, Birgit, who is in this because she is really driven to make sure that nonprofits don't get like basically cheated by consultants um, when it comes to their technology purchases. Like that just drives her insane. And so she's compelled to sort of be involved educationally around that. I've got another volunteer who um, basically for me always represents my consultants. Um, and so therefore he's involved with my community because by hosting these Tech for Good meetups, He's building his own personal reputation and building his business ultimately. And so those are the kinds of things you want to do. Say like, what are the, because that those personas help you get to, if that's what drives people's participation in the community, well, well that's really helpful because now I can then start creating experiences that help get them to their desired place. So let's think a little bit about Pikachu. So what do we know about Pikachu? We know that Pikachu is a yellow electric rat creature. Um, you know, he is apparently 20 years old. I looked that up on, YouTube, on Google and there it was. Um, Pikachu does not believe in gender binaries. So that's another thing we know about Pikachu. Pikachu is a resident of Pokemon world. And so that's sort of the context for Pikachu. Um, Pikachu has a weird occupation, which is like some kind of weird semi-indentured battle creature um, who lives like in a little ball. Um, it's not for the claustrophobic at all. Um, and Pikachu, we know, has got a master's in electrical engineering, clearly, all that use of electricity. Um, and as for income, Pikachu has paid all the ketchup he can eat because that's the number one thing he likes to eat, and that's like his motivation sort of at a financial level. So that's a little bit about our friend Pikachu. And let's say we would like our friend Pikachu to, I don't know, let's, let's have Pikachu do something. We're going to say we want Pikachu to uh, say join, join a new battle group. And so you're trying to recruit Pikachu to join your Pokemon squad. So that's our goal right here. So, you know, basically we want to get Pikachu to join the battle squad. And so given all that, let's, let's think about this goals and motivations. So what's, what's Pikachu's goal? So Pikachu, you know, has a goal, which is like loves victory, clearly <laughs> super into it. Um, what are some other things we might know about Pikachu that might be able to get him to join or her or it to join the battle squad? You're gonna have to just like make some nonsense up with me here. Mm. 
what else do we know? Um, oh, we know Pikachu uh, hates living in the Pokeball. It's very, it's very claustrophobic. Um, and what else do we know about Pikachu? Yes, uh, loves other electric type Pokemon. There we go. So those are the things we've learned. Um, but oh yeah, but of course, you know, Pikachu has sales objections. You know, Pikachu's got like some words he says, like, you know, Pikachu loves victory, but you know, hates risk. Doesn't want, you know, and change. Like those those are like, you know, things that make a little rat creature nervous. Um, sales objections, like what if there's too much water on like, you know, the other like the other Pokemon battle, like, you know, doesn't want to get electrocuted. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, those are some of the things we can think about. And, uh, and what are the obstacles? Um, basically, you know, say, well, first of all, there's this indentured relationship with uh, the Pokemon trainer. So, so those are some of the concerns. And so, looking at all of that and then you can start thinking of like what brands are they into uh, but you can start saying like based on this how would we start building an argument which is to say like that pikachu should be joining your battle so pikachu loves victory well then you're gonna say like you know we have the most kick-ass team so there's one of them um what are you gonna say they like other electric pokemon we're gonna say like you know Maybe we're gonna say like, you know, there is other Pikachus on the team. There's a great one. Um, but you say like, you know, hates risk possibly, but we can say like, you know, how about, you know, we aren't traveling far. So, you know, we're gonna reduce some of the change. And so the, you know, you can go through this in a non-ridiculous way for your memberships to start thinking about who are they, what are their motivations? Um, and that's, uh, you know, a useful tool as you go through building and figuring out your community. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, as you've got that pyramid, then you, got, you start thinking about that, which is like, where does this specific person right now fit into that pyramid? Um, and what level could they potentially move to? Um, you know, do you think we could take, you know, Pikachu up to like an in contributing mode? Um, and then the other question is, how do you know that that persona you've built out is ready for the next level? So those are always the questions you ask yourself as you go through these personas. And then the last thing, which we don't quite have time to run into, but I always think is, is the other flow which is to say, once you've start, started to figure out your engagement pyramid, well, the other thing you can start doing is you can actually start building these process flowcharts. And you've probably seen them in the past. You know, here's an example from XKCD, where it's like you start with, you know, you start with this key part, um, and then you run to these decision diamonds. And these decision diamonds are really interesting because they force a terrifying rigor on you, which is to say each one of them forces you to make a binary decision. Well, there's only two options that ever come out of these typically. And that's really great because by focusing up each decision point and narrowing it and making it very much yes, no, what you can then start to do is you can model that into your CRM and start to automate steps. Um, so instead of you saying like, well, let me think about that. And then I think this is the right email reply. Instead, you get to say like, oh, if they click this button in the first in welcoming email, well, then I know exactly what they want to get next. So you send them like, here's a follow-up email with you know some event templates. Um, and then maybe they haven't done anything for three weeks after that. Well, then it's time to send the follow-up email. But if they did follow up with you afterwards, well, then you don't send that other email and you can start doing some really sophisticated work around automating out your community. And so that's really helpful. And, you know, things like Lucidsharp will have all these tools to help you start diagramming 
each one of those decision points out within your community. Anyways, those are uh, three tools you can use. There's lots more, um, but you know, those are ways you can start thinking about how do you actually like take the messiness of community and and start putting a little bit of structure around it around it by doing some diagramming and whatnot. Poor Dev, I know. I apologize for throwing too much Pokemon at you. Um, it was an act of cruelty, but I had just the right aged cousins living with me at the right time to uh, have gone pretty <laughs> deep into the Pokemon world. Yes, I also didn't grow up with Pokemon, uh, so I was a bit out of it, but I feel like I enjoyed the, I enjoyed learning about it. <laughs> the things you come up with late at night, they don't always work, let me tell you. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's essentially it. Anyone have like any, any kind of questions or other kinds of models they really love for modeling out like their own community? I'd love to hear about other styles people have used. I haven't used any styles, but I'm trying to figure out how to reward people who are becoming like, I guess, between the model of like uh, endorsement endorsers are not quite leaders. Mm -hmm. So you're trying and, to move people up the engagement ladder. Deb, tell us a little bit more about your community. Um, so we have virtual events each week. And then the community is where we connect um, following the events and uh, to go d deeper into each topic because they have Zuba calls are only an hour. Uh, it just, I just opened it up in um, the spring, so it's pretty brand new. I only have a few members, 109 people in um, the Mighty Network that I built. Um, so, and I didn't have an audience that I brought to the Mighty Network, so it's all new stuff. So I'm just trying to figure out how to like, from nothing, grow something. And I understand I'm learning more about community management and understanding how these communities are really built by these people that come up and they like start to get really, you know, they're posting, they're interacting, and then they're encouraging other people to interact. And then, you know, they're actually like, maybe they lead some of their own events or they host a group eventually or something like that down the road when they get to that point. But I'm not quite sure how to get them up into those different levels. So Deb, your community is still quite small, but are there any kind of like typical indicators um, that are that the people who have moved to that next level of engagement seem to exhibit? Like, is there something about them that's different from others? I mean, they're just more interested in sharing resources, I guess. They're, they're doing more sharing than other, they're mm -hmm. not just commenting, but they're also sharing resources. Cool. Now, Sophie, of course, has worked with people on the creation and growth of many communities over the time, I've, you know, and has done these amazing stuff on these like virtual whiteboards. Um, <laughs> like, how, how do you recommend people start thinking through, like, how they actually build that engagement over time? Um. I use something called a transformation map with most of my clients, um, which is pulled. It's a little bit of a combination between a user journey and like, um, what's the name of that? A sentiment map, I guess. I'm um, curiously Googling for this thing. Yeah, this is my own term, so I'm not sure you're going to find much about it. But um, basically what I, I get people to do is to really think through, it's no different than your pyramid. I think I just turned it on its side rather than going up or down. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, it's up, it's down, it's to the side. side. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but really getting to think through, like, what are you wanting to promise as the experience in the community and thinking through as your user is joining, what are they thinking, saying, doing, and feeling at that point? And where do you want to lead them to? So for a lot of community members or leaders, um, or at least the ones I encounter, their hope is that people join the community and stay forever, which is like, 
hate to break it to people, but most of the time there's an ending point to most members in a community, whether it's five years from now or six months from now, doesn't matter. But there's this transformation that you're, you're providing within the community. People want to get better, smarter, more support, something from being in that group. So with a lot of my consulting clients, that's what we do. We start by, okay, when they're joining, who are they? And when they leave, what do you want to leave them with? Um, and then from there, that helps us start mapping out, okay, if they're thinking, saying, doing, and feeling these things at each stage in between that or each milestone that I want them to reach, what are some of the things that they need most at that moment to make them go from step one to step two and step two to step three? So then we're able to start mapping out, um, you know, what are the key things we want to teach them and how are we going to teach them those things? What are the people we want them to connect with and how are we going to connect them together? Um, and really from there, and again, it's on the, the boards you were just uh, being extremely nice about, we're able to start visualizing, okay, in the community, we need these features, we need to pull in these tools, we need to set up these automations. And then we get really smart about how the experience is set up. So yeah, so it's it's kind of a model that I've developed really just based on my experience of building communities. I don't think there's a scientific uh, term for it. It could be a sideways pyramid if you really wanna um, inspire yourself from it, but it's, it yeah. So it meshes really that user journey with, you know, the psychographics and then also like, what are the elements that we need to put in place to really support the person at that stage and beyond. And then it starts getting really obvious, uh, probably because I've done it a million times, but it starts getting really obvious, like, okay, if we're needing to facilitate weekly online chats, then we need to have a platform in place for that. And how is it going to connect to our email marketing tool or our online group? Um, and that's how we're able to kind of create the ecosystem of the community that way. There's some questions there. Oh, I'm just uh, trying to take notes on oh, okay. what you're saying because it's all gold. Thanks. So they're not actual questions. I just want to make sure I'm not standing here, not answering your questions. They're just notes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I like to plan it. It's not very, like, they all get to the same thing. I think it's just a matter of how you think and, and how the people you're in line with. So the communities that I work in are a lot of creative thinkers. So it helps to have this map in front of them and start being very visual with them because that's how they connect the dots and how, that's how their brain works. For other people, they might prefer a spreadsheet, um, but with my creative people, they just love that freedom of being able to put like the equivalent of post-it notes on a board and like move things around and then really think through it. Cool. Thanks, Christine. Just uh, thank you. letting us know if you're heading off. Yeah. Sophie, also, thank you so much. Um, careful, we're going to put you to work again, even though you tried to retire from this community. <laughs> well, not from the community, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you're like, I don't want to be in charge. I'm like, well, maybe we're going to have to put you in charge. We'll see. <laughs> you're pulling me back into that leadership square, aren't you? <laughs> I know, but actually, I think the way you frame it is different because I'm always taking a existing communities in my experience and then shoving them into like, how do we kind of yeah. retrofit this, these milestones into it after the fact? Because it's often just like these things already exist. Whereas your model is very much like, where is the end state? And then what are some of the stages? Because I think in my community, we're pretty comfortable with having some people just like, they're always going to be at stage two forever. And uh, yeah, but yours is more journey based. It sounds like. Yeah. And I think that the difference in those two is that the people that I help integrate community also have a business objective that goes with it. So I'm usually working with a business owner that wants to create a community based product within their business, whether it's a learning community because they're teaching a course or, um, they are, you know, gathering people on, under a membership model or things like that. So we always need to be thinking of not just what does the community do for its members, but also what does it do for the business? Because if it's not fulfilling a business need, then they're spending a lot of time not helping their business grow. So I think that's the nuance there. 
um, or the, the asterisk I would put to the way I plan community is that there's mine always has some kind of business under uh, underlying foundation to it um, really at that point. Right, where you're trying to sort of at some level get everyone into some monetized relationship. Whereas in my nonprofit world, I'm always working on that like sales funnel of like, I just want to get 5% to make a donation. Yeah, and it's not always like, how do we move 100% people there? I think there's very much a pyramid like you were saying. So there are some people um, who are in the category of maybe they've they've signed up to the 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 free community and they, but they are a fierce advocate of that community and they're talking about the business and the community helps generate money because other people are buying courses. Like they might not be the ones investing, but they're being that brand advocate at the same time. Um, so we nurture those people a little bit differently, but they play an equally important role in the whole ecosystem of it. Um, but obviously we want to try to convert as much as we can to either like a paid offering or um, even just paying for a membership to be part of that community. Cool. So we're two minutes left to the hour. Um, you know, anyone have any final questions or insight they want to drop on us? I just want to say thanks. That was uh, helpful. Um, still clarifying my ideal member and my big purpose, which is what the Money Network titles those as through the Community Designer course. So I will continue to clarify those as I build my audience. So thanks. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm just going to wrap with my call to action, which is to say, if there's something you're excited about and want to lead a conversation and you do not need to be an expert on this, talk to me and I would love to work with you on leading a future session as a host and I'll be your cheerleader behind you, making sure all the technical stuff happens. Cool. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Cheerleader. <laughs> Always a pleasure to see all of you. And uh, let me shut this down. Have fun, y'all.